So um, thank you all for joining us for the book launch and discussion. First of all, some very quick um, housekeeping uh, here. This webinar, it's being recorded and will be uploaded to um, the ANU Malaysia Institute website afterwards. And um, your video and microphone have been disabled. To submit a question to the panel, please do so via the Q&A button on your screen, on the bottom of your screen. And we will address the questions later in a Q&A session in the last 30 minutes or so. And um, I, hope that, uh, I hope today's discussion can be carried out in a more relaxed manner. And please feel free to um, join us by uh, submitting your question, uh, comments, or any thoughts through the Q&A button. And please specify if you wish your question to be answered by uh, 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 a specific panelist. So. Um, before I introduce our speaker today, um, um, maybe just introduce myself. I'm Ying Sing. I'm currently a, a postdoc fellow at the ANU Malaysia Institute and uh, ANU's School of Culture, History and Language. And before I introduce my uh, fabulous speakers today, I would like to first give our participants some ideas about the book that we are launch launching today. Um, let me try to share my screen. Um, Yep. Uh, so, um, so this edited volume, uh, published recently by uh, Malaysian Publishers Strategic Information and Research Development Center, also known as Gerak Budaya. Um, this volume is co-edited by me and Dr. Ngoi Guat Peng, uh, currently Associate Professor of Chinese Studies at Sultan Idris Education University in Tanjung Malim, Malaysia. She's now uh, with us too today as participant um, because we only have one and a half hours today and she kindly wishes the space to be given to our fellow panelists today. Um, yeah, so she joined us as participants. Um, so the book is derived from two uh, conferences held in Kuala Lumpur in 2014 and Yogyakarta in 2016. So um, those times, those time, uh, Guat Ping and I were still with NTU Singapore. She's my PhD joint uh, supervisor. So although both of both of us are not from um, history background, but um, the Malaya question has always concerned us, and we thought it would be good to kind of bring together people from different disciplinary and linguistic backgrounds to talk about this part of history in the spirit of um, building an organic um, platform to reflect on our historical links and fractures in the region, Nusantara, or the Malay world, through the sharing of knowledge, experiences, and resources. And so during the conferences, we not only invited um, scholars from East, um, from the Malay world, but also um, activists, filmmakers, and publishers. And we also invited scholars from East Asia, such as Taiwan, or Hong Kong, Okinawa, and Tokyo, to serve as commentators, so as to have um, inter-referencing and exchanges on our common um, decolonial historical experience. So in short, uh, what we want to do with this book is to talk about the trajectories of tr transformation of nations and nation states in the region, especially during the Cold War period. Um, we like to examine um, the contestations of different ideological struggles from the 1940s to 1960s. And we like to um, debate or think about how was um, the idea of Malaya being formulated by different um, imagined communities. And from, from that idea, how do we uh, rediscover our historical links and fractures in the Malay world, namely um, Malaya and later Malaysia, Indonesia, Singapore, and the Philippines. So in the book, um, over 20 contributors touch upon a wide array of issues, including uh, the conceptions of Malaya in nation building, uh, Malaya in art and literature, anti-colonial uh, nationalist struggles, imagine communities in the Malay world, the building of nation states and, and others. So I would like to emphasize that this is the collective efforts of many individuals. And I would like to take this opportunity to mention every name who made this book possible. Um, first of all, Professor Jomo KS and uh, Sa'u Ali, uh, our important public intellectuals in Malaysia who wrote forwards um, for us in this book and all contributors, um, including uh, 
Abdul Rahman Abong, Hong Lisa, Tan Pin Jin, Ko Teck Huat, uh, Lai Chikian, Kwa Sai Ren, Hi Wai Siam, Tio Liken, Budiawan, Muhammad Saleh Ramli, Ho Ki Chai, Ung Yit Tin, uh, Hilma Farid, Sandra Komanikan, Romeo Kuramin, Ramon Gulimor, uh, Farawi Fakke, Mas Mazna Muhammad, and Francis Lokowa. So I hope for those of you interested um, in this topic can purchase the book through Gerak Budaya website. Uh, I will, I'll send the link in the chat box later. So this, um, the Gerak Budaya bookstore, the independent bookstore and publisher in Malaysia has been really crucial in publishing um, radical and alternative views in the study of the Malay world. And we'd like to thank um, Gerak Budaya's Pak Chong uh, William and Charles in publishing this 500, over 500 page academic book. So although um, we thought, you know, people thought academic books don't really sell, but uh, I would uh, like to kind of announce that this book was the second uh, best-selling book at Gerak Budaya last month. And we hope that trend uh, could continue and that the discussion of history um, is not confined to the academia only. And so I'm done with the book promotion. Now I'd like to introduce our fabulous speakers today who have kindly agreed to participate in this webinar. So um, webinar, uh, the format that we didn't imagine ourselves to be so familiar with before 2020. And so um, we have Romeo Kuramin, uh, Senior Assistant Professor from History and International Studies Program at the University of Brunei, Jerusalem. And we also have uh, Mungitin Iting, uh, Senior Lecturer of the Chinese Studies Department of University of Malaya. And also we have Farabi Fake, Lecturer of the History Department at uh, University of Gajah Mada, UKM, Indonesia. And uh, we have Tan Pin Jin, uh, PJ, who is a visiting fellow at the Hertford College of the University of Oxford, while he's also the founder and managing director of New Narrative, a platform for uh, Southeast Asian journalism research, art, and community building. And today we are mostly honored to be joined by a distinguished historian of Southeast Asia, Emeritus Professor Anthony Reed, who uh, recently uh, is also known as uh, the novelist, Tony Reed. And thanks, Tony, for agreeing to join this panel and share your comments and criticisms. And so, uh, because we only have about one and a half hour today, uh, as we know, everybody is having Zoom fatigue recently. So we try to keep this webinar compact and uh, each speaker will have about 10 minutes um, to present um, their works. And we um, have about half an hour for uh, the Q&A discussion later. So right now, without further ado, I will pass the floor uh, or the screen to, uh, to Romel. Welcome, Romel. So anyway, so I'm not just going to use my PowerPoint anymore. So I'm just going to talk through, is my video on now? Yes, yes, it's on. Now. Okay. Okay, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us this uh, morning. I'd like to thank uh, Yinching for organizing this uh, book launch and um, for inviting me here. Okay, so the paper that I'd like to talk about to share with you is entitled Result in the Rethinking of uh, um, the Analytics of Malayness. So the very idea, okay, the Filipinos as Malay, it's a, a common textbook knowledge among educated Filipinos. And um, this is um, at least um, as early as 1900s when the Americans established um, the educational system, public educational system, but uh, it is also likely that as early as the 19th century, particularly in the late 19th century, the idea is pretty common among um, educated Filipinos. So this idea, however, um, all but tiny minority in the region find this, uh, this very odd and even laughable. So I remember the first time I went to Singapore, so I was about to do um, graduate studies in NUS in 2000, and uh, at, at Changi Airport, when I wrote down Malay as uh, in the blank for race in the immigration form, I was bluntly told off by the 
by the immigration officer who was Malay looking. He said, of course you're not Malay, you're a Filipino. So there you go, my, my uh, idea of identity um, went out of the window. So many international scholars of Malay or Malayan studies share this skepticism. So examples include that um, Tim Barnard's uh, edited volume, 2004, Andaya, uh, Leonard Andaya's book, um, Trees, A Leaves of the Same Tree, 2008, and Anthony Milner's book, The Malay of 2008. So what are some of the reasons for downplaying or denying Filipino Malayness? The idea seems bogus, superficial, or contrived, often associated with politicians' uh, project like Mapilindo. And a lot of people are thinking this might be some kind of misconception or false consciousness. Um, it does not also conform. Another reason is that it also does not conform to the long-established idea of what is Malay. So with over 90% Christian population, Filipinos easily do not fit into the idea of Malay being a Muslim, using Malay language, and adhering to Malay traditions. Another reason is um, the idea of Filipino Malayness might, um, it, it trivializes identity in general, and Malayness in particular. So some scholars express the idea that it's stretching the definition of Malay too thin, and it would lose, in the process, conceptual efficacy. Now, what are some of the consequences of this kind of uh, downplaying or denial of Filipino Malayness? So I argue in the paper that it imposes that kind of premature limits, both geographic and conceptual or analytical. So by confining to the Malay world proper, so the tendency is to focus on the so-called core marker or reference points of uh, Malay identity. And in the process, um, yeah, ignoring the possibility that this kind of um, reference points are product of their own historical context. And um, if you take a look at it from another standpoint, it might be different things. So as a consequence of that, the, it affirms the restricted definition of Malayness that is confined to Islam, Bahasa Malayu, and Malay customs. And in the process, it um, could hamstring even uh, efforts of even the serious critics of Ketuanan Malayo. And an example that I'd like to discuss is Milner's um, The Malay. The problem is um, um, the time is limited. And when I, uh, I think I'm just skip through my critique of Milner's uh, book and um, go straight to another consequence in the aim. And um, another consequence of this kind of denial is the difficult, uh, difficulty of historicizing and denaturalizing the hegemonic form of Malayness. So by examining Filipino Malayness, I hope to historicize and denaturalize the hegemonic Malayness and redirect the analytics of Malayness away from inadvertently serving as ideological basis for a racial, uh, for racialist politics driven by the notion of uh, Malay supremacy or Ketunan Malayu. So the main question that the, my paper addresses is what difference does it make on the analytics of Malayness if we take on board Filipino Malayness in general and Rizal's thoughts in particular? So um, I quoted some of the parts of the letters or writings of Rizal um, and um, one of the things is um, uh, Rizal very frequently in his writing self-identify as Malay. He called himself, for example, in one instance, Malayan Tagalog. In, in contradistinction to his friend who was, uh, he, who, whom he called Mestizo Filipino or Spanish Filipino in another translation. Um, he also... Um, in one of his letters, he also um, described uh, what he saw in the pa Paris Exposition of 1880 and 1889, whereby he, he, he said that there, in, in, in his uh, le letter to his family, he, was, uh, he said that there is, and I quote, 
there is a Jap Japanese town with its small houses, restaurant, theater, dances, music, etc. The people are of the same race as ours, and we almost understand each other. They speak Malayan and, and I, Tagalog. So also Rizal highlights the positive features of Malay. Um, um, while, um, yeah, so it's one thing that in his writings that he, he really emphasizes that uh, Malayans are resilient um, this, despite numerous wars, um, they, their number has trebled. So, so that kind of uh, positive appraisal of uh, Malay, um, Malay identity. And um, when he talked about the, the no, his notion of Malay identity, he includes both um, the um, Muslims in Mindanao and Sulu, he called them Malayans of the South, as well as Christian Filipinos, as simply Malayan Filipinos. So he also also used terminologies like Malay Tagalog or Malayan Filipinos. So regardless of religion or linguistics or ethnic identity, Rizal lumped various groups of Filipinos as Malay or Malayan. Now, despite tendency to highlight the positive things about Malays, Rizal also called out Malays' um, weaknesses about uh, he, he talk in his letters or in his writing about piratical attacks of Malays of the South and that kind of notoriety uh, being um, known for uh, atrocities and murders. He also talks about passion for gambling, which supposedly is innate in adventurous and excitable races. And the uh, Malayan race is supposedly one of them. Um, now, Rizal was, while, while it's frequent for Rizal to, to praise the Malays, um, and he often emphasized his affinity to yeah, his identity as a Malay, he was also rather skeptical of this view. And um, we could see here his critical approach to things. So regarding the question, for example, the supposed Malay origin of um, Tagalog language, he said that um, he's wondering because he knew that Malay language is simpler than Tagalog. And he was wondering if something simpler could be the origin of uh, a more complex, because Tagalog grammar is much more developed and more, more complex than Malay. And um, he was thinking um, some months before he died, he wrote that, and I quote, he wanted to, and I quote, to steep myself in Malay in order to put an end to the inquiry into what is true and what is false in the common beliefs that Malay is the origin of Tagalog. And also about the idea of Sumatran origin of Filipinos. He said that um, he cannot draw the conclusion that Filipinos had come from Sumatra. The similarity between two individuals does not necessarily mean that one is the father of the other. Both can be children of a deceased person. And for this reason, I believe it is difficult to decide whether we originated here or there before having studied thoroughly our respective histories, languages, and religion. Um, he was also... Um, <clears throat> It was, he also mentioned in one of his letters that um, the Malayans should not be considered either the original or typical race. They have been exposed to many foreign and powerful factors that have influenced their customs as well as their nature. So as early as that time, Rizal recognized the fact that the Malay world is um, a transit point, is a place where a lot of trades and um, uh, all these kind of trades uh, pass through and a lot of people come here and go. And that kind of character of the Malay world makes the very idea of Malay rather, um, yeah, needs to be subjected to further scrutiny. So I'd like to conclude that, um, yeah, so by focusing on um, the idea of Filipino Malayness, um, it allows 
us to denaturalize and historicize the hegemonic status of Malayness in Malaysia. Um, you cannot discount the Filipinos in the discussion on Malayness because they did it ahead of the Malays in the Malay Peninsula. So as early as 1880s, there are a group of Filipinos who were very conscious about the use of Malay identity as one of the components of the incipient Filipino nation national identity. So, um, yeah, it highlights the contingency or constructiveness of identity formation. By looking to Malay, Filipino Malayness, we cannot but highlight, emphasize that uh, identity is historically contingent. It is a construction, and uh, this kind of construction was um, a consequence of forces happening within the time. And um, also, by looking into Filipino Malayness, it enables alternative imaginaries and narratives of Malayness. And I got this idea from Joel Kanz. He was talking about other Malays. And in his book, Other Malays, he, he would like to look into the history that never was. And it's precisely this kind of Filipino Malayness fit into this, this mode that um, uh, scholars who have been neglecting Filipino Malayness in the analysis of Malayness, they, they, they might as well look into Filipino Malayness to see what could have been differently um, happening. So why Rizal? Rizal was among those who have crystallized earlier than Malays in the peninsula the notion of Malayness as a constituting element in national identity formation. He was even called the first Malayan by Ibra uh, Anwar Ibrahim himself and uh, other, other um, um, intellectuals in Malaysia. So Rizal's humanistic and cosmopolitan views, they offer ways out of this straight jacket of Malay-centric identity politics. And also Rizal's pragmatic yet critical attitude towards the use of Malayness foregrounds the very nature of identity making project. Okay, so he will use it when it is needed, when it's necessary, when it is helpful, but at the same time he will drop and he will criticize it when also he needs it. And uh, in other words, Rizal's approach to Malayness, yeah, he's critically appreciative. His um, approach is measured and um, he was creative in appropriation. At the same time, he was rather ambivalent about it. So the tendency to regard Rizal as an exemplar of uh, Filipino, who, Filipino, early Filipinos who promoted Malayness is actually not uh, quite accurate because he, he doesn't, um, he's among intellectuals of his time, his idea was not the same with others. Filipino intellectuals during the time were competing, were discussing, debating among themselves what Malayness is and how does it fit within the, the Filipino uh, framing of, of national identity. So he's just one of those people who contributed. He, by no means he was not the only one, and by no means that his idea was the most uh, dominant. Thank you very much. That's all for now. Thank you, Romel. So right now we uh, uh, invite Etienne to uh, give her presentation. Thank you, Insin and Yue Ping for inviting me to present uh, my paper on uh, title Ethnicity and Nationalism. Uh, I'm looking at two political struggles in Sarawak after the Second World War. Um, okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. My paper analyzed the discourse of colonialism, freedom, and independence revolve around two political movements. Uh, the first one is the anti-section anti movement led by the Malay leaders, the Sarawak Malay leaders. And the second movement is uh, mainly led by the Chinese, uh, the Chinese Communist Movement, which was pit in the 1950s and 1960s. Um, this paper also, I would like to use these two case studies to examine how ethnicity uh, as an ideological work and how nationalism as a modern constructions, how these two were at play in forming nationalism that characterized the fundamental political features of today's Sarawak. 
Um, this paper compare, it also compared the way the British respond to the movements, particularly uh, government racial propaganda. Uh, it, looks, it also looks into the fundamental differences of these two movements in their understanding of uh, Sarawak nationalism, which are shaped by their own ethnicity, own cultural uh, affinity. Um, yes, there are two local political developments, but at the same time, I am also uh, take into account the transnational links of these two groups, because this paper assumes that uh, their transnational exposure was important in shaping the local nationalism. Um, okay, um, the anti the anti session movement of Sarawak um, took place right after the Second World War. Since the primary sources on the views of the anti session leaders were limited, so. Uh, my analysis on their motivations draws largely on commentaries made by, by researchers. So based on the literature available, the anti-session movement that led by PKMS or the Malay National Union of Sarawak, they insist on the reviving personal rule of the white Raja and they accept the they accepted the, the, revive, the restorations of uh, the Brook Raja as equivalent of independence. Um, the Malay scholar like Sanit Saib, he believed that this was in fact a strategy of a larger plan of seeking independence for Sarawak. Because if you, they believe, he believed that uh, the, 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 the uh, the movement to restore the, Ra the Raja uh, administrations or the Raja rule is because the, at that time the Malay leaders believe that it is easier to attempt independence from, from a weak Raja rather than the British colonial government. So um, ethnic survival, ethnic survival is my paper argued that ethnic survival was an underlying motivation in, in this session, anti-session movement. Because the sessions, this movement was viewed as an encroachment okay, of British bureaucratic imperialism and the Chinese predominance in economic life. Um, this, the threats posed by these two alien groups based on the, uh, the my, based on the literature that available to me, according to the researcher, the observation and the research, uh, the, the, the Malay groups that views uh, the threats posed by these two alien, alien groups have dominated uh, and the survival discourse in local Malay newspaper, Udusan Asas. Udusan Asas is the mouthpiece of, uh, uh, of anti-sessionists and they attribute the protectionist policy of British colonial government as the main cause of the Malay's economic backwardness. <clears throat> and the British economic policy deprived the Malays of the opportunity to participate in the modern economy. So meanwhile, the Malay intellectual, I mean, in, uh, in that period and, of, and leaders, they were also alarmed by the presence of uh, the ethnic Chinese who were labeled as uh, Bansa Asing, uh, non Bumi Putra, and their Chinese were also stereotyped as a successful, a successful businessman in, in, the, in, the, in Utusan Asas, the Malay newspaper. So, according to a scholar, Wei Ke Jin, in fact, there's a, a, a small group of Iban from the first and second divisions supported the anti session movement due to the same factor. Their, their fear of the Chinese domination in economy under the British colonial government. And the movement, anti session movement, also promised to increase Iban representations in all levels of government. So um, the anti session movement um, reflected an awareness or a construction of civilization based ethnicity. Uh, Robert Rees, in his account of this uh, anti session movement, he traces the social and cultural connections of Sarawak Malays to the larger Malay community in Nusantara. Uh, 
For instance, he gave an example, the president of the PKMS, he attended an annual con congress of Malay associations uh, that held in Singapore. So if this is one of the indications of uh, the awakening of a culture-based identity or civilization-based identity. And they also see the, the necessity to enhance the identity with uh, social institutions. For instance, uh, setting up uh, Pusaduan, like associations. And the awareness of Alam Layu or the Malay world is also a modern construction of uh, nationalism. First, the imaginations of being a community was fostered <coughs> foster through publications of Malay newspaper, uh, namely Udusan uh, Asas and others such as uh, Fajar Sarawak. And the term Alam Layu was used by the uh, editors, like Fajar Sarawak's editor, indicating an awareness of Malay world that comprised mainly of uh, Malaya, Tanah Melayu, and Indonesia. <coughs> and Sarawak is uh, on the periphery, is at the receiving end of the flow of the ideas of these Malay, um, Malay ideas and cultures. What is the response of the former communists towards the anti-section movement? In general, um, the Chinese society has been quite uh, very si silent on this topic. But in fact, according to uh, the sources, the memoirs of some communist, former communist memoirs, they did support the anti-session cause, but they didn't participate actively, especially at the when they, 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 when they knew that the anti-session uh, activists, anti-session activists want to restore the rule of the brutes. So that's, that's how they bet off. Um, okay. So, but after the 1960s, the pro-establishment scholars began to cast a positive light on the anti-session movement and dubbed it as a Malay nationalist movement, which fought for independence for Sarawak. If you look at the, uh, one of the example to that, evidence to that is, uh, the anti-session movement end with the assassinations of a former British governor. And, but the, it was sentenced to death and this murderer uh, so, so I'm sorry, uh, in those days he is called a murderer, but uh, now he is called nationalist. Okay, he was assaulted as an uh, anti colonial uh, nationalist or Benjuan Melayu uh, Sarawak under the present government. So you see the change of the interpretation of history, historical events, and also the discourse. Uh, there's another, the second movement is uh, the Chinese led communist movement. Just as the anti-session anti movement, cultural affinity have influence on political activism in this movement. Uh, the Chinese of Sarawak, they, always have, they have always retained cultural and social ties with China through uh, uh, historical migrations and trading relations. So when the communists took control of the Chinese government, and China rose as the, as the regional center for Asian commun communism. The Chinese in Southeast Asia were in better positions to assess information, propaganda, and reading materials of the communism, since they were mainly available in the Chinese language. However, the, the British racial propaganda cast, this, uh, so, cast their co cultural and social connections with China in a bad light and attribute it as the most important factor of communism in uh, Sarawak. Um, what I think is missing is the local experiences of the Chinese in Sarawak. It's, it's, it is the, I believe that is the main cause for uh, political uprisings. Okay. Um, but this factor has not been adequately recognized as an important cause. For instance, many note that the Chinese generally felt that they were being discriminated I mean, during those days, against they being discriminated by the government of, of the day, and so they fought for the equal treatment with the nat as the native of Sarawak. But the issues received very little attention from the authorities and also the pro-establishment researchers. 
may partly due to their immigrant status. And although some Chinese and also some Chinese, they are affluent and prominent business figures, but in the 1950s and 60s, a large majority of them actually reside in rural areas as um, hand-to-mouth farmers, whereas a sizable of urban Chinese work as uh, laborers. So after the war, slow economic development in Sarawak has exacerbated the hardship in the life of, especially of the working class Chinese. So they are looking for an answer to their plight. So um, new ideologies such as socialism, socialism, communism, fill this intellectual vacuum. This ideology blame Western capitalism for causing exploitations and impoverishment of the working class people. That explains why the places that became fertile grounds for the underground communism were the Hakka villages in first divisions and the Fuchao settlements in the third divisions. Both communities were mainly involved in agriculture, but they su suffer from the government's rigid restrictions on non-native land ownership. So they could not legally obtain suitable land sufficient for their expanding uh, needs. The and another issue is uh, the Chinese schools. Majority of the Chinese children went to the community run and sponsored Chinese language schools. And unfortunately, those schools were looked look upon with suspicions by the British government. So the Chinese youth who have higher Chinese education found it difficult to apply jobs in the government and also in foreign uh, companies. So, so, uh, so this is, so you, that's why you see the political awakening among the Chinese after the war and it has fueled their resentment of British nationalism. So like many third world society, they aim for liberations from colonialism translated into political plans, including armed resurgencies. And this is, for, this is one of the uh, communist uh, in, uh, uh, comments made by communist leaders, former communist leader on the communism in Sarawak. He basically described that the communism in Sarawak is part of a global justice movement that centered on anti-colonialism and capitalist-led imperialism. Okay, um, this is, I'm going to conclude, okay, very soon. The anti-session and communist movement, they both share the characteristic of modern uh, nationalism. Malay intellectuals who imagine a shared cultural and historical origin rooted in Alam, Layu, communicate their stories and goals of Sarawak via Malay printing press, regional meetings, and personal contact. But it's struggle with the reality of a poorer society where Malays were uh, a minor, minority native, native group among the Dayak. On the other hand, uh, the communist movement, who, which also attempted to recruit members from all ethnic ground, but had not been very successful. The, it suffered from a lack of cross-ethnic social means to entice non-Chinese supporters because most of the channels of communist, communism was Chinese schools, newspaper, which were almost ex exclusively Chinese. So, um, so by analyzing the rise and fall of these two ideological struggles, my article attempts to understand the, and the dominations of ethnic nationalism discourse um, in contemporary Malaysia, uh, using Sarah as a case study. So despite being dominated by uh, a single ethnic group, these two movements, but in fact, both, of the, both groups took genuine efforts to foster cross-ethnic uh, collaborations. And um, however, the, the movement, the anti-colonialism elements were twisted by the, uh, by the, uh, by the government and they were by the racial propaganda and both of the movements are seen as a conspiracy okay, to pursue uh, a self-interest at the expense of other ethnic groups. I believe, I mean, our Malaysian government is still doing the same thing. Okay, okay two more. So after the 1960s, the political party system in Sarawak has very much resembled the national political system. Um, political mobilization in general is organized along the uh, ethnic uh, patronage system. 
So the suppress of the leftist ideological movement further flourished the ethnic politics. At the same time, the suppress of uh, class divide, the discourse of class divide also gave way to the, to the influence of the rhetoric of ethnic discourse, which also led to the demise of ideological oriented parties and the unpopularity of uh, uh, class discourse. So I believe that, um, so to, I think it's important that to recognize diverse paths and aspirations to achieve self-determination de in, in, in the history of Malaysia. So this is, I believe is a step in these directions will reduce and immensity among different ethnic groups and nurture the spirit of tolerance among citizens. This is also my response to the questions posed by the editors to me about how to build a new solid solidarity in Nusantra. I think both the term, uh, like the term Nusantra denotes a region where the boundary was drawn based on certain cultural traits especially the Malay language and perhaps the religions. So if we take Sarawak as an example, you have people who, who are living within Nusantra but did not, may not share the same cultural characteristics, uh, such as uh, they, they may not speak the lingua franca, like uh, the Daya of Sarawak and the Kadazan in, uh, of Sabah. But of course today, due to the national education policy, a uh, majority of them, they speak, uh, they speak uh, Malay language. But in the past, they do have their own language. So, and they also possess different religions. In the meantime, they, they were also indigenous people within, uh, who, who don't share this cultural characteristic, but living within the region of Nusantra. And, how about, and the new members, such as the ethnic Chinese, who came, uh, during the, uh, who, who came in a large scale since the 19th century. So I think we should start re recognizing the the, the presence of the other and acknowledging uh, people's diverse experiences by looking at the missing piece in respective official histories. So, um, and also address uh, and inject new ideas, new perspective in historical writing. With that, I end my presentation. Thank you, Itian. Um, right now we invite um, uh, Abi Farbi Fakke, um, to present on um, how Malaysia becomes an other in Indonesian's popular discourse. Welcome, Abi. Yeah, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about uh, my article in the, in the, in the book, uh, which is titled Malaysia as an Other. So this is actually uh, not about Malaysia at all. It's about Indonesia, it's about perceptions of Indonesia, uh, of Malaysia, um, because of its complex nature and because it is such a... Um, not hegemonic, but it, it's, it's continuously there within the Indonesian imagination uh, of the outside world. Um, yeah, so one of the things about, about it is it's really a uh, dichotomous character, or you know, very character in one sense, there's a feeling of, uh, of Malaysia as being uh, a problematic nation to Indonesia, as having like threatening uh, stances of position, so uh, Malaysia as being uh, or as having uh, uh, conducted actions that would be considered by Indonesians as being um, uh, harmful or, de or deleterious to the to the Indonesian nation, and so you have these like, especially uh, ten years ago at the height of this uh, anti-Malaysian sentiments in Indonesia, like various uh, forms or groups, civil societies that would uh, form in front of the Malaysian embassy. To, to you know, uh, to air their grievances and various kinds of grievances. But at the same time, of course, the other aspect is the highly integrated nature of the two economies, especially in connection with Indonesia providing so much labor to Malaysian uh, plantation sector or to uh, Malaysian uh, urban sector. So, uh, in that sense, there's a strong connection. Uh, economic connection and it's very uh, well uh, the relationship is very strong but at the same time uh, it's also uh, filled with uh, aspects of, of uh, anxieties uh, from within Indonesia so why is this present and and 
uh, why does uh, Malaysia uh, posit this kind of liminal uh, space in which various Indonesian anxieties sort of appear? And this is where my uh, my article really focuses on um, uh, exactly because of just the extent to which Indonesians identify themselves with Malaysians. I mean, we meet as uh, if I were in you know outside of Indonesia meeting with a Malay from Malaysia, I would recognize a lot about him. It is similar to me, but there's a specific sense of otherness, of, of difference that is almost unbridgeable in a sense. And in that case, uh, uh, the, how do we how do we understand the roots of difference that is really uh, really constructed only in the last uh, 50, 60 years in the context of rising uh, nationalism uh, of, of of both nations and in the context of the Cold War uh, divide between the positions of Indonesia and Malaysia, especially in the 50s and, and 60s. Uh, now I actually started. Now I'm not a a, a, a a, uh, I don't focus on Malaysia in my research. Uh, and, you know, uh, we had the Malaya conference in Jogja. It was a very interesting conference, especially because uh, it, it, it reminds a lot of Indonesians to be less insular, because we are rather than an insular kind of society. And it, it, it forces us to sort of meet and commingle with, with the kind of different viewpoints, especially just beyond the border in Malaysia. Um, one of my my interesting uh, focus on the on the discussion has been the series of really weird um, uh, conspiratorial books that have been published in the last 10, 20 years uh, after uh, after the fall of Suharto, uh, uh, in which Malaysia was seen as 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 a threat. So if you look at this uh, uh, these uh, titles like uh, um, you know it, it it goes into this kind of uh, Nativist rhetoric that is right wing that you know uh, this kind of Jewish conspiracy and, uh, 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 and connecting it with Malaysian identity. I mean, in that sense, first of all, it's, it, uh, it's I think a lot of Indonesians would would see it as ridiculous. But in the, but in another sense, these are popular books, so in that sense, there's a market for it, and there's a there's a uh, 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 there's a so the position of Malaysia as that other has various kinds of potential, including in particular. Uh, these kinds in which it's the discussion is really related to Indonesia's own anxieties and, and vulnerabilities. Um, I talk a lot uh, then in, in trying to sort of construct uh, Malay overtures to Indonesia in a sense and how that has been sort of taken within the context of Indonesian political uh, the political realm. Um, for instance, I, uh, initially I look at Burhanuddin Al Helmi, the, the founder of the PIS. Uh, who is a supporter of the political union of Indonesia, looking at his writings and then seeing, of course, that specifically uh, Malaysian uh, discussion on race, which is pretty much uh, almost uh, absent in the context of Indonesian uh, political discourse. Uh, and, then I, I, and then I look at whether uh, this kind of discussion on race appear within the context of Indonesian uh, discussion amongst itself in uh, the BP UPKI, which was the Indonesian, uh, which was the uh, the Congress to discuss about Indonesia's basic political framework in 1945 before Indonesia gained independence. And it's quite clear that in the discussion uh, with people like Mohamed Hatta and others that uh, race was sort of denied uh, because of its sort of unscientific nature and that because of Indonesia's various uh, uh, ethnicities and, and so forth, uh, there was a, an overarching uh, agreement for a kind of civic nationalism. Um, and so, in that sense, Malaysia, Malay, Malaya had a had a had a had a, uh, uh, a a weird position, especially in the context of the way in which BPPKI discusses about Malaya. So, on the one hand, there were people who do support this kind of race uh, construct. For instance, people like uh, uh, Muhammad Yamin, who would advocate for the daily Indonesia, which would include Malaysia, something which Muhammad uh, Burhanuddin Al Helmi also. Uh, alluded to. But on the other hand, actually a lot of the discussions uh, looked at it, uh, looked at Malay as a geopolitical foe. So for instance, this uh, Kiyah Haji Muzakir, who uh, was uh, Muhammadiyah, who founded the Islamic College here in Jogja actually, um, uh, said about this in the Bepi the Malay lands is the greatest pistol aimed at Indonesian lands. Uh, 
and so if the peninsula is taken by another country, then the strength of the Indonesian Republic cannot be perfect. So, in this sense, Malaya uh, really uh, represents the anxiety of Indonesia's uh, uh, geopolitical, uh, uh, I, you know, uh, what do you call this? Um, a geopolitical aloneness, you know, because Indonesia had this weird position in which it was, in a way, it, it was created during the Japanese uh, occupation uh, by the Japanese uh, occupying forces. Had, uh, so when it, 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 it arrived, uh, there was fear of it being considered a puppet state by, by, the, by, the, liberal, uh, by the liberal Western world. Um, and then we, I, I jumped to the 60s, especially in the context of, of the, um, the, what do you call it, the, the, the confrontasi uh, uh, by Sukarno, uh, Ibrahim Yaakov, uh, who, was a, uh, who was also a proponent for the integration of Malaysia into the Indonesian uh, state, uh, went to Indonesia uh, in the 40s, but then he, he, he then also went back uh, in the 50s, he lived in, he became an Indonesian and died in Indonesia. And so, he, and he was actually uh, uh, put into the hero's grave in uh, Jakarta after he died. But he actually also has a weird position where very few people in Indonesia know him. He's in that sort of liminal position in which he, in the context of Indonesia's attitude toward Malaysia, uh, it, it sort of closed off. Um, now, Jacob, of course, came in under uh, Indonesia under Sukarno, and he was very much, uh, in that sense, a, a, uh, a supporter of Sukarno. Uh, let me just... Uh, so that Malaysia was a feudal creation that has potential of pulling Indonesia apart, that Malaysia was pro-Western and will become the economic, political, and defense center of capitalism in the region to suppress and conduct subversive action on Indonesia, that the presence of foreign soldiers in Malaya is a direct existential threat to Indonesia's independence, that Malaya is the center for Western economic activity and thus threatens the economic development of Indonesia, that Malaysia may in the future be used to foment conflict within Indonesia. Um, and, and Jacob sees Malaya as a liberal capitalist creation, a cooperation between the cosmopolitan Malaya, Chinese, Indian, uh, 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 and Chinese and Indian Malaysian, uh, and British capitalism, and of course the Malaysian uh, ruling class, the, the aristocracy. Um, what's interesting about Jacob is, of course, this is a very Sukarnian worldview, the sort of anti-liberal uh, Western kind of uh, construct. Uh, uh, but he also wants to push for this idea of in Indonesian uh, race or Malay, Malay race, because of course that the context of of his uh, argument of including Malay, Malaysia within the Indonesian, the wide Indonesian sphere, is uh, racial. Um, yet in the, in that matter, then uh, Sukarno did not really view the terms in the, in, in in the matters of race. Sukarno viewed the revolution that he. He was instilling as is is very universal, and it's 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 part of that uh, new emerging forces to you know the kind of the, the non-alignment kind of new emerging forces that would destroy the old uh, imperial forces. Uh, so in that case, it, it, Sukarno did not view it as as race. And in his speeches, Sukarno actually uh, oftentimes allude to the Chinese of Malaysia uh, to sort of uh, revolt and join uh, at least. Uh, you know, join Indonesia or at least, you know, be part of that kind of revolution. Thus, in his speech, he says that Malaysia is thus an effort to suppress the Chinese people, the Chinese Malaysian. Uh, this is through, uh, this is thus an overboard effort. The over, overboard meaning to suppress the vote of the Chinese uh, because, of course, they're more uh, of a minority. I hope that the Chinese brothers in Singapore understand this, that Malaysia is created in order to suppress their vote with that of the Malay vote. Now, you can argue that maybe this is just Sukarno trying to uh, raise bait uh, uh, the, uh, the conditions, obviously understanding how race played a role in the politics of Malaysia. Um, but at the same time, I think it's quite clear that Sukarno, as a Javanese, Javanese Balinese, uh, did not view the kind of construct of race that, that uh, Yaakov and others in the context of Malaysia has uh, offered. And so in that sense, uh, and Sukarno is very much a, uh, a pro-Chinese uh, uh, president in that sense. In, in, in the 60s, it, there was a shift in Malaysia towards a more of an alignment with the Chinese uh, communist state. Um, so there is that, that discussion. The question, of course, is to what extent uh, uh, 
can we look at present vernacular as a continuation of that uh, Cold War division between the between a, a racial versus a, a geopolitical uh, uh, threat. Um, <clears throat> so, as I mentioned, the height uh, of this is in the 2010s, and it's really related also with Indonesia's uh, local political condition. The the uh, um, what do you call that? The the election presidential election in 2009 was quite significant because. Uh, the attack against Susilo Bambang Yudhoyono was that he was a, a neoliberal, and so in that sense, the uh, Sukarnoist uh, approaches to understanding things, uh, you know, appeared in in the in the in the vernacular, uh, just as a, as an attack against the uh, the president. Um, and but we, as I've uh, seen that, then the, the the two approaches have actually continued on, um, lay as kin as. Uh, Discussions of, for instance, the Malayo Islamic civilization, Tamad and Malayu, or Alam Malayu. But a lot of this has been much more particularly uh, present within the context of Malays in Sumatra, especially in Diao, in which kinship was obviously much more evident than in Java, in which there's very little um, <clears throat> similarities uh, outside of, in fact, we speak Bahasa Indonesia and Islam. Uh, and so, um, so that 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 sort of, you can see. Uh, occurring during the new order, but actually uh, becoming stronger in the post new order period because of strong decentralization, a stronger uh, rising identities within the, 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 the regions. Uh, and then, of course, Malay as, as threat. And this, these two books that, that I discussed earlier are in, within that uh, discussion of Malay as threats. So, uh, national anxieties are, uh, are the right wing expressions. Uh, well, in Sukarno is obviously left wing, but in, in that sense, you know, the kind of discussions really uh, talks towards the uh, anxiety that, that's similar to sort of the kind of anti nativist uh, right wing uh, uh, that is present in a lot of other places in, in, in the world. So I just want to quote in one of the books, this one is when the, the first one. Now, in, in front of the uh, Indonesian nation's nose, Malaysia, neo colonialists want to destroy the unity, the Muslim population of Indonesia. Through neo-colonialist Malaysia, American Jewish groups wants to see the Republic of Indonesia destroyed into pieces, just like the Soviet Union communist world power, so that they can conquer Indonesian territory one by one. It's, uh, obviously, it's uh, it's very funny, and you know, very few people would, very few educated people would believe this. But it's just an interesting way in which they construct, you know, a Malayan other that is very much uh, uh, it's, it's full of, uh, of, of of potential threats. And then uh, uh, the other book, one. Uh, one of the books, this one, the second one. Um, uh, let me just quote in one of the discussion. The Malays are obviously not Jews, but they may have fraternal ties with Jews. Uh, it is possible that they have a special relationship, despite the fact that Malaysians are overwhelmingly Muslim, uh, that are against Zionism and is also hated by Zion. Is it possible that Malaysia is hated by the hated hands of Jews? Again, another really absurd. Uh, Discussion and you know it's, it's an absurd book in a sense, but uh, it's just it's, it's it's fascinating to me because it opens up the kind of uh, other things in which uh, Malay 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 Malaysia and Malaya as a as a as a vessel for uh, appeared within the context of Indonesian um, discourse. Um, so I guess what I wanted to say is that yes, Indonesia and Malaysia is now a very strong uh, strongly bonded country, and we. We send many people together. Uh, economically, it's very uh, integrated, but it, it's still there is still a lack of understanding that continues still today. Uh, so there's still a, a deep uh, divide, especially within Indonesia, of trying to understand the outside world. This is a this is not just a Malaysia problem. It's an Indonesian. It's a specific Indonesian problem, and perhaps because of our language being. You know, Indonesians don't speak English most of the time. There's a there's a divide in trying to understand the outside world, which is very really difficult to sort of bridge. Um, uh, it's also fueled by nationalist anxieties of Indonesia with relationship with the outside world. This is also something which which is rooted in the 50s and 60s and the Cold War colonial the Cold War period in which Indonesian nationalism grew out of because of our feeling that we were surrounded by enemies from you know Australia. And Malaysia, North, uh, we were sort of alone within this this uh, world surrounded by enemies. 
So in that sense, there is a continuation of, of this Carnian view. It's not, obviously, this is not the only view out there. It's actually only a, a small part of the Indonesian view on Malaysia, but it's undeniably it's part of the complex others, others of other views of Malaysia or Malaya uh, in the context of Indonesian uh, popular discourse. Um, just to, to sort of engage with this is, is actually a window to Indonesia's own complex, misunderstood, and often tenuous relationship with the outside, uh, with, with Malaysia and to some extent Australia, which represented uh, a distorting lens because in a sense, Indonesia is represented by the views of uh, Malaysia and Australia of Indonesia. Uh, we don't produce much of our own text uh, and a lot of the uh, uh, newspapers that are read in the West or in the wider world is actually Malaysian and Australian newspapers. So it is, um, and at, at the same time, it's uh, uh, the complex relationship is also present within the com uh, Indonesia as a, this really, I mean, Indonesia is a very big country, with hundreds of millions of people with its own sort of, um, uh, its own sort of complex environment of, of uh, a press environment and in which it has to interpret everything from the outside to Bahasa Indonesia and discuss within the context of Indonesia. So, so again, it, 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 this other thing is, is actually, it opens the way of understanding the, the complex nature of Indonesian nationalism and, and the complex relationship of Indonesia has with the outside world and in particular Malaysia as its most strongest and, and strongest link to the outside world. Um, thank you very much. That's my presentation. Yeah, thank you, Abi, um, for writing a with a with, um, uh, perspective from Indonesia towards Malaya. Right now, we invite PJ, PJ Tan, to talk about the Malayan vision of Lim Chin Xiong, a Singapore a leftist a political figure and intellectual. Welcome, PJ. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is PJ Tham. I'm wearing a batik shirt, standing in front of a bookshelf, and my pronouns are he, him. I want to thank the organizers for inviting me here to speak to all of you today. Uh, and I want to thank all of you for joining us today um, to, to discuss and launch this book. My chapter in this book is about Lim Chin Siong, the most influential figure on Singapore's decolonization, and some of the principles that he based his post-colonial reimagination of Malaya on. But rather than talk about my chapter, I mean, you can just read my chapter, right? I thought I'd talk about why I wrote the chapter and why this book matters. Why should we look back on Malaya and on all these different imaginations of Malayanness and try to imagine a different kind of Malaya? Why, why is it important that we have all these different imaginings? And I think this, it actually touches on the central, the, the most important challenge facing humanity today. Today, we live in a world governed by three major ideologies which are breaking down. Neoliberal capitalism, liberal, or more accurately, illiberal democracy, and nationalism. Specifically, the nation state as the political expression of nationalism. And in order to address the dangers that arise from nationalism in the nation state, we need to be able to reimagine the world around us. And to do that, we need to understand where we have come from, how our world was imagined in the past and why we ended up here today. And this is where this book can, I hope, make a small contribution. Why is nationalism so dangerous and why do we need to reimagine it? Well, the concept of the nation state arose out of the wreckage of World War I as the great European land empires, Germany, Austria-Hungary, the Ottoman Empire, were torn apart. So... The, this idea of nationalism, and especially the nation state, was powerfully liberating by articulating the idea that people should govern themselves. But how do we group people into political units? Well, if everyone has a nationality, if they belong to a nation, and nations should be sovereign and self-governing, then each nation should have its own state. The problem is that it's impossible for every nation to neatly map onto every state and vice versa. And over time, autocrats quickly realized that monopolizing control of the definition of the nation allowed them to target their enemies by saying their enemies were not part of the nation. 
Therefore, they are anti-national. And from there, it's a short step to saying that their enemies are a threat to the nation state, and that justifies acting with extreme prejudice against all enemies, real or invented or perceived. So the nation state ideal powers the breakup of empires and the liberation of colonies, which form new states throughout the 20th century. But at the same time, we get horrors like genocide. Who belongs to the nation? Who does not? The Rohingya? The Uyghurs? The Papuans? The people of Mindanao? The people of Sarawak? What nation do they belong to? What state do they belong to? And what happens if their definition, their self-definition of their own identity is different from the state government's definition? What happens if my definition of my own identity is different from my government's? In Singapore, we have seen people who disagree with the government being tarred as anti-national, as traitors on the most spurious grounds, like me. And that's what happened to Lim Chin Siong. His vision of Malaya, a sovereign, democratic, socialist Malaya, was deemed by both the colonial and the post-colonial PAP government as being a threat to their vision of Malaya. And he and his colleagues were ruthlessly arrested and locked up without trial. And one of the primary reasons for it was that they were anti-national. They subscribed to uh, uh, an ideology that sought to undermine the nation communism. But of course, Chin Xiong is far from alone. In post-colonial Southeast Asia, Southeast Asian governments have used their monopoly of legitimate violence to impose their own vision of national identity on all of us. But so many of us who live, experience, and imagine Southeast Asia differently have been oppressed, silenced, excluded, And we've seen throughout history that national borders are negotiated and constructed. They're artificial. But so too is national identity constructed and collectively imagined. There is no objective reality to national identity the way, say, uh, a, a rock is a rock. A rock is a rock objectively, right? But tomorrow, if every Singaporean woke up and just forgot that we were Singaporean, decided we were not Singaporean, but a different nationality, we were Earthican, then we would be Earthican. So this is the central contradiction of the world today, that we organize ourselves politically on the basis of the nation state, which is predicated on the nation, which is entirely imaginary and subjective. And that gives immense power to those who can control that identity. The people who can control the identity of the nation can control the state. And that's why the most fundamental political contest of our world today is not about policies. It's actually about identity. Because today, a vast amount of political power comes from being able to define and control national identity. This is the consequence of over a century of the nation state ideal. Voting has become very tribal. Voters vote and they feel entirely justified in voting on the basis of a very narrow identity that they identify with. And this then brings into power leaders who use fear of the other, right, and exclusionary nationalism to win power. Leaders like Trump and Orban, or indeed Mahathir and Muhyiddin, right, are natural products of our historical trajectory. They're not aberrations or exceptions. They are people who've risen to power by stoking the fears of people who do not fit in with their national identity, and especially against minorities and migrants. These politicians attach values which support their position and attack ones which don't as anti-national. So ironically, nationalism, which enabled so much liberation via decolonization, is now a primary justification for oppression and exclusion within nation states. And it has led to our world becoming so much more divided. And that toxicity of nationalist rhetoric And the politics of fear means that a wide range of issues are now tied to nationalism. Migrants, dilution of one's identity, moral decay, loss of economic livelihood, and so on and so forth. Politicians find it easier to mobilize voters on the basis of nationalism and fear. So all these important issues become tied to the conception of the nation 
And once these politicians win, they say they have a they can say they have a mandate to ignore the values and norms of democracy and overturn the structures and institutions which protect and promote democracy and spend their entire time in office oppressing those who don't fit in with their definition of the nation as being enemies, a constant campaign to root out the subversives within us because having won the vote, they can claim a democratic mandate to do this. So for us to have a better future, we need, first of all, to promote the values that underpin democracy, like rule of law, separation of powers, protection of basic liberties, of freedom of speech and assembly and religion and association, transparency, accountability, promoting the means of democracy, not the ends, understanding the process of democracy is more important than the outcome, because without all this, democracy doesn't exist. But we also need to push back and promote alternative conceptions of the nation. And this is one of the ways I think this book is really important and can really help us. Because our fight is to push back against narrow exclusionary views of the nation and define identity, national identity, as incorporating ideals of fairness and justice and respect for the individual. And this book in particular, I think, sheds light on a lot of these because if we look back on our history, we can see the hypocrisy today of the leaders, of our post-colonial leaders, especially here in Malaya and Southeast Asia. Authoritarian leaders love to tie obedience to national identity. You know, they say things like, in our nation, we value society above the individual. These are Asian values, not Western values. But it's all hypocrisy because these are the same people when we were a colony who talked about individual rights and democracy and freedom and liberty, and then they got into power and then suddenly they embraced the values of the former colonial master and promote colonial values as Asian values. But third, I think we have to ask ourselves, can we ever truly escape toxic nationalism as long as we continue organizing ourselves as nation states? And here again, this book helps us imagine our communities, our nations as being broader than the states that they are being limited to right now, right? Our third challenge is to reconsider the whole concept of the nation state itself and reimagine better ways of organizing ourselves politically that protect all individuals and treat all individuals with dignity and respect. So this book, I hope, can be a small contribution to this fight for a better world, a better tomorrow. This book tries to remind us of all the possibilities that we imagined in the past, and we can imagine for a better Malaya and a better Southeast Asia. And I hope it will not just push back against narrow exclusionary identities which have been imposed on us, but to inspire people to believe that a better world is possible. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Vijay, uh, for bringing the discussion of um, nationalism um, from the anti-colonial period to, uh, to today, to contemporary times. And thanks for keeping, to, uh, keeping the time as well and uh, for promoting the book. Thank you. And right now, we have our last speaker of today. Um, we invite Professor uh, Anthony Reed to share a few words uh, on this book or in general. Um, uh, any thoughts on, on, um, on the topic of Malia? Um, welcome, Tony. Well, thank you very much. Can you hear me all right? Yes, I here you are. I, I can't yes. see myself, but I don't need to see myself. Yes, we see you. <laughs> okay. Well, um, congratulations, first of all, to, to you, Ying Chen, and, and your colleague, Guat Peng, um, and all your collaborators for bringing this uh, book to uh, fruition. It's uh, no easy task being an editor, as I know very well. Uh, um, academics in particular are very difficult to uh, manage, and like herding cats and so forth. But uh, the book is, in fact, uh, a lot more coherent than I think perhaps our today's presentation might suggest. Um, I mean, I think the, the four wonderful presentations opened up so many different boxes. I mean, that of global significance, um, but uh, might have suggested that uh, it was really a very heterogeneous book. But of course, in reality, it is overwhelmingly focused on uh, the peninsula uh, of Malaya, including Singapore, of course. 
and um, and its its dilemmas through through time through history, um, and I think it does have have a coherence, and it does help very much to to explore the uh, the paths not t- taken to quote another such book uh, and, and the suppressed voices and contribute as as PJ says to the um, the dream of of uh, a genuinely pluralist um, identity. Uh, Pluralist nation, can you say? Uh, without, I mean, always there will be there will be tension, as as PJ reminded us. Um, uh, why why bring an oldie on when there's all these new new voices we're hearing? I mean, this is uh, I, I have to ask myself um, basically to provide a benediction. I think to say, yes, you've done well, and and this is terrific. And uh, we who who belong to an earlier generation are immensely grateful and, and, and uh, gratified that, that there are these new voices, that uh, there is great hope uh, for a, a pluralist uh, community in Southeast Asia. Um, but, I mean, while we oldies tend to forget the, the name of the author we most recently read, we do uh, remember the old times <laughs> with particular vividness. So I'm going to talk about the centrality of the, of the 60s, because that was my uh, Malaysia. Um, that's when I encountered it, and of course became a Southeast Asianist, became excited about it all. And uh, for me, therefore, it seems obvious that this was an extraordinary turning point. But I can see that it's a, it's a, it's a loaded vision, but it is my vision. Uh, I arrived in, in 1965 uh, for Singapore's withdrawal from, from Malaysia and left not too long after the Kuala Lumpur riots in 1969. And, and I, I suppose I see this as a sort of a, a bookend of, of, of Malaya, if you like, of, of a, a certain dream of pluralism. Um, not the end of the world, but, but a, a major change. And um, um, I want to sort of talk about Malaya, Malaysia, in that 50s, 60s moment because I think we are, I mean, of course, we're romanticizing it and, 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 and uh, asking it to bear more, more weight of hope than, than uh, it, it can possibly do. But um, the dreams were still there uh, up until, I think, 1969, even if they went along with immense tension and contestation. Um, as as PJ reminded us, the 20th century has been the century of Asian nationalism. I mean, of course, we, we're not done with nationalism. We, we kind of thought we were. We, I mean, those who were focused on Europe kind of thought nationalism had reached its ghastly apogee in, in World War II and uh, the, the horrors of the, the 30s and, and 40s, uh, and that we were sort of cured of that disease. But, I mean, it's been obvious for a long time. Of course, that didn't cure Asia. Asia had a much um, half century later. And, and God help us, if we need another horrendous war in Asia to cure Asia of this, this um, what should we say, dangerous uh, um, drug of, of uh, which nationalism can become. It, it can also be lots of other glorious things. But, I mean... It, for me as a sort of a, I guess I'm a kind of a historian of nationalism, among other things, um, it's, it's clear that around 1900 was a, a marked beginning uh, of uh, the nationalist era. Um, its ending is, is much, perhaps not yet, but uh, it certainly began with a bang with the Chinese Revolution, the Filipino Revolution, um, with the unification and centralization of uh, at colonial hands by Indonesia and Malaysia, uh, of education in, in Western languages and in Western modes, uh, of new elites who, who adopted this new mantras of, of progress, uh, of um, uh, change, of modernity, and of education as the way to bring all these things about. Malaya was among the slowest to catch the bug, and um, to invent a name for itself. I mean, that's part of Malaya's problem, of course, of what, what to call itself. Um, and it, I mean, historically, it's, it's rather difficult to say. I mean, the, the continental Europeans called it Malacca. The um, 
English speakers tend to call it the Malay Peninsula. The, the locals called it uh, Ujung Tana, if, if they called it anything. They, they, they didn't call it Tana Malay, uh, not until much, much later. But um, uh, Malaya was, was an important part. It was a necessary part of making possible a kind of Malayan nationalism. Of course, it was invented by uh, scholar officials like Swetnam and Winstead, um, but um, it, was, it was adopted enthusiastically by at least the ed English educated. Uh, there had been, of course, older nationalism, Chinese, Islamic, and even Indian. Um, but in, in the 1920s, for the educated, English educated elites, um, this inclusive term um, for the whole of British run part of the peninsula um, uh, became, became inescapable in the 1920s, just as Indonesia became inescapable in the 1920s for uh, that group of elite um, in, in Indonesia. Both, both words, of course, invented uh, on the whole by Western scholars in the first instance, but um, picked up. Uh, was it clearly, was it only for the English educated, this, this Malayan dream? No, because, um, because the Malayan Communist Party, of course, also in the 1920s, which was primarily catering for the Chinese educated, um, also adopted this uh, name uh, and called, the, uh, called its party and the first major party to be dedicated to Malaya and its independence was, uh, was the Malayan Communist Party. And um, so... Uh, it's not just an English elite, English educated elite uh, thing, but of course it, it was rejected by much of the Malay elite in, in the 1940s um, in favor of um, uh, older models. So um, Malaya never became, I think it's fair to say, never became the dream of most of the, uh, of the Malay educated as a whole, I think, and indeed became the enemy of some of the politicized UMNO elite. Uh, as we all know, Dato On, the founder of UMNO, preeminent national leader of the late 1940s, presumed to be the, on the way to becoming prime minister of an independent Malaya. He adopted the dream of Malaya as the route to independence. When he failed to persuade his UMNO to call itself the United Malayans National Party instead of the United Malays, um, and, and thereby to accept non-Malays into membership to make it, make it a multiracial party. When, he, when that failed, um, his dream of, of leading this party to independence and to becoming prime minister, of course, failed with it. And instead, he founded the Independence of Malaya Party. Again, there was the most prominent Malay politician of his day, indeed the most prominent Malaysian, Malayan politician of his day, um, adopted the dream. But as we, as we know now painfully once again, uh, electoral democracy has its unfortunate way of puncturing multiracial dreams. Um, the Malayan electorate torpedoed on's dream uh, in 1952 and 1955, preparing to vote for their own racially exclusive parties. Um, and so uh, for many Malay voters in the course of that antagonism, uh, that division within uh, the Malay community, Malaya itself became a negative concept. No, we don't want to be part of Malaya. Only Tana Malayu was really acceptable as a name for this, this political entity. I mean, that was a, a dangerous basis, we can now say, looking back, on which to enter independence, the, 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 the notion that two more or less equal halves of, of, of the country have different names for this country and different ways of thinking about it. Um, but, and, and so you might say that that, that was already the death of, of Malaya once Dato On uh, was defeated. But I want to insist that it, it did survive into my, my 1960s, um, and, and largely because that... Uh, dilemma of two opposing visions of what the country was really all about was um, overcome through this brilliant construct, this brilliant invention of Malaysia, uh, which um, trumped both Malaya and Tanah Malaya. Um, 
to become the accepted only term of the new nation. And it was, of course, inherently a very plural and even more plural nation than uh, Malaya, um, let alone, of course, Tana Malayu. Um, and so when, when I arrived, there was still a lot of enthusiasm. Um, perhaps, I mean, the, I, I suppose it was expressed my, my first year, 1965, was, was uh, mind-bogglingly exciting in that the um, Lee Kuan Yew was running his Malaysia and Malaysia campaign. Um, no, no, better not. <laughs> uh, um, Meet my wife. <laughs> but, um, um, and, uh, but of course, that, uh, that crashed in flames in, uh, in Malaya and led eventually to the, to the unraveling of, of that Malaysia that would truly have been a very impressive, I mean, that dream that this rainbow country could emerge to, to represent a, a, a flourishing and wealthy uh, progressive democracy in the heart of Southeast Asia um, that um, was in trouble as soon as Singapore left. And I, 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 since I've been sort of comparing autobiographies with Wang Gungwu lately, I, I mean, one can't help acknowledging that for him probably it was pretty obvious in, in, in the crisis of 1965 with Singapore's departure, this wasn't the Malaysia I signed up for. You know, that, that wasn't the deal. Um, and, but for me as a foreigner, things were still very exciting and very full of conflicting hopes and dreams of, of uh, the possibilities of, of pluralism. Um, and and uh, Malaysia became what, what I guess um, exactly what Indonesia became. Both Malaysia and Indonesia, of course, were words invented in the 19th century by Western scholars reaching for some sort of way of describing this unit this, of, of the peninsula and archipelago. Um, and um, the one was picked up you know, in, in the 1920s by, by Indonesian nationalists, the other picked up in the 1960s by would-be Malaysian nationalists with a little less Enthusiasm, I guess, a little less um, conviction that that was the only uh, the only loyalty in town, but it was enormously important in in moving that step towards a genuinely plural uh, society. Um, I, I I I'm just as I sort of look back on that time and thinking what happened to Malaya and, and Malaysia. Um, I, I, I kind of think that besides the dreams, which are much more fun to talk about, there's a sort of much nastier realpolitik that underlay two kind of bookends of 1945 and 1969. When, I mean, these are the two outbursts of, of racial violence in the peninsula when things looked like they might, you know, get out of control and, and real violence and real massacres and so forth took place. And, and I, I guess the 1945 one, after the Japanese surrender, when the, the guerrillas came out of the hills, it must have convinced non-Chinese and perhaps Malays, in, and, and certainly Malays in particular, that if this whole thing gets out of hand, if we, if we descend into violence, we're going to be the losers. And uh, these guys who have the guns and so forth have come out of the jungle are going to be the winners. And thus, we don't want independence. We, we want uh, the British to look to make sure this doesn't happen. Uh, so, 1969, it hadn't happened. Chinese carrying guns in the, in the jungle were no longer significant. Uh, Malaysia had a, a substantial military and police, which was overwhelmingly uh, Malay. And the, uh, the people who suffered from an outbreak of violence were, of course, the Chinese. And uh, that became, it wasn't immediately 
at, at the time when I was there in May 69, what outraged me was mostly that, you know, the victims are being blamed here. You know, what, what, how can this be, be fair and, and, and correct as an understanding of what's going on? Um, that the, the Malaysian media were, and the government in particular was, was um, blaming, the, blaming its, the victims. But, but looking back, I, I, I can't help thinking that it, it was a profound demonstration of a, of a sort of truth that the, uh, which, I, which fortunately um, uh, the countries I've come to call home uh, haven't been through this kind of trauma. Um, a lot of countries haven't, uh, but I guess a few have, of, of knowing what happens if this social contract breaks down, if we start killing each other. How's that going to turn out? And I think uh, non malays knew that it was going to turn out very badly. I mean, in terms of loss of property and loss of life. So I, I, I mean, that's a that's a nasty realist thing, but it's it's um, it underpins the, the wonderful big ideas that Vijay Tom was talking about, which are, are more interesting. And and and, and uh, I, I want to end on a much more uh, positive note that my own my own faith in in Malaysia is restored by by looking at the book and and uh, hearing you guys talk, uh, and I think it is a, a wonderful sign uh, of um, of the vibrant uh, diversity of of Malaysia. So thank you. Enough from me. Thank thank you, Tony. Um, Tony is the one who lived through the remaining of the Malayan dream and later which became Malaysia, you know, so yeah, I think it's incredible the, that you also witnessed the death, um, the, the death of, of Malaya in some, in some sense. So yeah, um, can I invite every speaker to turn on their video? Uh, I'm really sorry about the time. Uh, we might have to extend this uh, webinar for it. Uh, maybe 15 minutes more for Q&A. We have a couple of questions here I, and I will try to um, address them. So any, so if uh, from the participants, if you'd like to uh, ask a question, please submit through the Q&A session. And right now I have um, first one for Abi um, from Arman Azra Azlira, who mentioned that, um, Abi, you mentioned the Javanese understood race differently than Malaya. And what is this difference? And would you say there is a convergence of understanding of race as time went on? Thank you, uh, uh, Thank you, Arman Azra, uh, for the question. Uh, yeah, I, <clears throat> I think this is something which a lot of Indonesians started understanding when uh, there were a lot of, during the uh, cultural uh, debates, you know, Indonesian accusing Malay, Malays of, of, of stealing Indonesian culture, that we didn't really have a, uh, a, 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 an alignment of what race means. And I think the root reason for this uh, within Indonesia, uh, Javanese in particular, has been uh, the kind of colonial construct uh, of the Netherlands Indies that differ from that of the British Malaya. The Netherlands Indies focused on sort of strengthening Adat uh, rule, which is very much cultural based. And I'm not saying that uh, colonial construct of the Dutch created Java or Javanese identity, but it sort of strengthened it and not, uh, and put it in a, or categorized it in a way that uh, makes it as the primary identity uh, base for, for the Javanese. Uh, the Javanese of course also has a strong sort of non-Islamic or strong um, Hindu Buddhist uh, component within it, so Java is very much <coughs> has a, has a very strong um, uh, linkage with Balinese, for instance. I feel like ja ba Balinese are probably the most uh, the nearest to the Javanese in cultural and and, uh, and identity terms, instead of the Muslims of Sumatra, for instance, the Malays of Sumatra. So, in that sense, ja Javanese uh, has a different uh, uh, opinion on the, the focus on Indonesia has always been on. On, on the idea of suku, which is based on adat, suku meaning ethnicities, and that represents hundreds of sukus in Indonesia. And then, uh, and that's where then when Malays come and say it, that all of Indonesian, all of non-Chinese or non-Indian Indonesians are Malays, that, that, that's a shock to a lot of Indonesians because obviously we don't uh, view uh, our 
identity with, uh, in that uh, racial construct. Uh, so I think that's the, uh, the answer. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Abby. There is one question directed um, to Tony um, from Arman as well. He mentioned that, uh, uh, Tony, you mentioned in your book, Imperial Alchemy, that uh, post-colonial nation states often organized through either ethnic nationalism or anti-colonial nationalism, and that Malaya would come under the former ethnic nationalism. Was there ever a possibility that an inclusive anti-colonial nationalism would flourish? Was this what you were talking about when talking about the formation of Malaysia in 1963? Maybe he sent some optimism uh, when you talk about um, the formation of Malaya, Malaysia. I, I suppose there, there was, in a way, this is what I was referring to in the, in the 50s and 60s. Uh, I mean, looking back, we say, well, that was an elite uh, phenomenon. I mean, but nationalism is always an elite phenomenon, so uh, we shouldn't just dismiss it because of that. Um, the, the, the sort of spirit in the, in the infant universities of, of the 50s and 60s uh, was definitely one of anti-colonial nationalism. Very mild uh, by comparison with Indonesia. I mean, you, you sort of, uh, you sense the, the, the sense of inadequacy. Oh, we're not having a proper revolution. We're not going out and, and uh, killing Dutchmen and so forth. But, uh, I mean, in fact, the, the Communist Party were doing that uh, and, and were not quite seen as, you know, you're not allowed to talk about that as, as nationalism. Uh, but it was, it was a kind of anti-colonial nationalism, but, but um, wrapped in, in, in something else, uh, uh, ethnic nationalism or uh, uh, diaspora nationalism. But um, yes, there was, there was that. And as, as I say, um, Dato On tried to ride that uh, idea. And the way Lee Kuan Yew tried to ride it too. Um, and um, of course, David Marshall and those who went before. Um, but um, in, in a way, it was confounded by, by electoral democracy, um, just as a lot of dreams seem to have been in danger of foundering against, uh, I mean, as, as you see in India, I mean, dangerously, and you, you see in Poland, and you see. Um, even with, with, with Trump and Boris Johnson, um, it, electoral democracy can be very inconvenient to the high-minded dreams of, uh, of what are inevitably an educated elite. Uh, and, and that's, I mean, it's a danger we're terribly aware of uh, today, as BJ said, and maybe he wants to come in on this. Um, but... It's also, I think, a salutary wake-up call to we elites. I mean, that we do get out of touch with real folks and in dreaming our dreams. And uh, so I, I, I believe in electoral democracy. Uh, I just wish it was a little more efficient in, um, uh, and perhaps indirect as a way of, um, uh, I mean, my model is Europe. Uh, I mean, which, which works like an indirect democracy. You know, they, the, the heads of, of, of the nations that can constitute Europe choose the executives. And uh, it works very well, but it's always going to be in danger of a populism uh, that will uh, show that this isn't what actually real people want. Uh, real people are kind of always afraid that somebody else is dominating them. It's not our show. It's it's it's, um, it's you elites, you liberal elites, or you communist elites, or whatever elites they are. Uh, and uh, there's always going to be this tension. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Tony. PJ, do you want to also answer the question? Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, just briefly, I think yes, definitely, there was a possibility of an inclusive anti-colonial nationalism. And Tony's right. I mean, the the decision of the British to to really throw in there are a lot with uh, ethno-nationalism in the form of UMNO rather than uh, allow a contest uh, between the uh, Malayan Communist Party and, uh, you know, and allow their form of uh, anti-colonial nationalism to at least try to take hold 
uh, I think, spelled the end of the chance of that anti-colonial nationalism uh, thriving. Um, and I think it's important to remember for elections, electoral democracy, unfortunately, how you design elections really matters. And in Singapore and Malaysia, we have elections which are directly descended today, right? We have elections which are directly descended from the colonial period, which were not just descended from the Westminster system, but also with uh, design elements that were intended to favor uh, the, um, the colonial elite, the colonial establishment. Uh, and, and that has only gotten worse over the years. So, uh, you know, the problem with electoral democracy is not just how people vote, but how elections are designed, the questions that you ask of the people, and you can design elections to get the answer that you want. And that's what's happened in Singapore and to a lesser extent in Malaysia. So I, I have, uh, you know, great faith in electoral democracy, but only if there's actually all these other things that need, that, that need to exist around it including free and fair elections, but also a genuine discussion about how elections should be designed and what the goal of an election is and how it's, what kind of opinion it's meant to reflect. And all these things are absent in our countries, unfortunately. Yeah, talking about electoral democracy and the current um, movements um, the con uh, in the context of contemporary nationalism, actually I have um, two questions for Ikien and Romel. Um, so that you, um, you know, we, we all um, get to answer questions. And actually, I, I would like to ask Ikjen about, uh, since Ikjen is from political science background and you study politics, and I wonder if you, com you could comment on the current uh, Sarawak for Sarawakians movements, S4S, especially how, because in your article you talk about ethnic factors also play a role in, in the kind of um, in the formation of Malaysia in anti session movement and communist movement. And I wonder how ethnic factors play a role and had it have an impact on the kind of Sarawakian subjectivity being championed right now in Sarawak. And this is for Etienne and uh, for Romel. Uh, I wonder um, whether, how does the discourse of um, Filipino Malayness resonate with the current discourse of nationalism in, in Philippines right now? Um, uh, how does that matter to contemporary Filipinos in terms of you know, recognizing the Malayness in, in, in the Filipino national identity? Itian, you want to go first? Uh, yes. Um, I think the this S4S movement, uh, the Sarah for Sarah game movement, is uh, it become a movement, okay, um, before like 2018 general elections or after the 2013 general elections when the Pakatang Harapan uh, has a chance to deny the two third majority in the parliament of uh, Malaysia. And there's, uh, there's many groups in this movement and they seem to have their own agenda but most of them, some of them based in Kuching and you have some certain groups in Cebu and Miri, different cities but according to, the, to, the, uh, to a survey done by Medica Center um, the, there are two major ethnic groups, youth, especially the younger generations which the Barisan National has, uh, has not been able to appear to the Chinese, especially Chinese youth and maybe in the, uh, increasingly the Dayak youth. They, but this group, this, they are attracted to S4S movement. So for, for the moment, okay, um, it seems like the, the ethnic Chinese youth and the Dayak youth, they are more attracted to this as for as movement compared to the Malay youth, okay. But at the same time, is they managed to hold several rallies in uh, cities, in certain cities, and it do it did attract a huge crowd. But this movement is is it doesn't seem to have a central leadership. Yes, you heard several leaders, but it doesn't seem to have central leadership. And many argue that it may challenge the ethnic politics, the ethnic political landscape uh, of Sarawak. But we, are, we haven't seen that happen because the 
the those the activists who are very who actively uh, advocate the Sarawak uh, regionalism, they also participate in electoral politics. But all of them lost their uh, deposit, meaning that when it comes to elections, they they didn't manage to get the popular votes. So we are not sure how it will affect the electoral politics. But this movement has not been, it seems like becoming less active over the last two years. We are not very sure the reason. Okay, but there are of course different sayings. Some say that it is actually as uh, supported by the ruling parties or ruling politicians who want to counter the Bakatang Haraban. Okay, this is okay, different explanations, but just want to uh, say that it is, uh, you have multiple groups and they're scattered throughout Sarawak and they are able to attract, especially the Chinese youth and diet youth to join this movement. And this is the only movement I have seen over the last 10 years in Sarawak that are, can be called a social movement across ethnic groups. Okay. Yeah, that's my response. Thank you. Yeah, whether or not this social movement can be developed into a political movement that uh, uh, makes some changes remain to be seen, right? Uh, can I add one more yeah, point? But sure. Sarawak for Sarawakian, this slogan is quite different from Malaysia for Malaysians. Because Sarawak for Sarawakian is, is based on an exclusive understanding of Sarawak. Uh, they want to... Um, but Malaysia for Malaysia for Malaysia is they want uh, the people advocate this they want to build a Malaysia uh, which recognize this is a poorer society so you can be you have to be more inclusive to include more ethnic groups but Sar for uh, Sarawakians is I would say that it's more exclusive okay in nature yeah this is my response yeah. thank you Etienne yeah Romel Okay, thank you for a very trenchant question. Uh, there were times in the past uh, decades when uh, uh, both the intellectuals and the politicians had a uh, stake in um, drug beating this kind of idea of Filipino Malayness. But there were times when only the politicians and not much interest on the, from the academics. Um, as of now, what I can say is the academics uh, have a, a greater upper hand on, on this at this point and, and whereby um, more and more um, Filipino intellectuals are discovering their more regional roots. Okay? It's a part of this effort to indigenize, to highlight this kind of uh, that element of nationalism that is connected to the region rather than just sim simply anti-colonial in, in, uh, in response. So you see um, um, scholars, for example, that, uh, that uh, latch on to the idea that uh, the only way we can develop Filipino identity is to rediscover um, this kind of old roots that we, at some point in the past, few centuries ago, we, we took, off, took away from. So Philippines supposed to be taken um, a different route that led, led, it to, uh, led it away from the Malay world. And we became more westernized. We allowed to be happy about our Spanish uh, heritage and American heritage. So for, for scholars who are keen more on the, this kind of indigenization effort, so the um, idea of um, emphasizing the affinity to the Malay world has become, I, I've noticed more and more of these younger scholars are, are uh, joining into this kind of ideas. And from the standpoint of the politicians, politicians are rather silent on this at this point. So we, we, we never know what will happen, particularly with, with the Saba issue will always be there it will never really die so but let us see what will happen in the future how how will it affect the the situation in Mindanao and people in Mindanao and still thinking particularly the Muslims in Mindanao particularly thinking of Saba as the lost uh, that kind of lost Eden that they, they are that they can reclaim and solve the problems 
So that will have a bearing on the notion of malayness. But as of the moment, uh, I, yeah, it's, it's the academics that are getting the help, this kind of ideas. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Uh, thank, thank you, Romel. Yeah, so actually, um, because we're running out of time, there is actually a question uh, uh, to, directed to me uh, uh, in terms of um, the use of Malaya as method in the introduction. I think um, I would just quickly uh, respond to, to this and maybe we, uh, we can call it a day. Um, so of course, the, um, so the title was Towards Malaya as Method. So it is of course in part inspired by uh, the culture studies scholar uh, Chen Guangxing in Taiwan, who kind of put forth the, the idea of Asia as method in his book. So, um, so uh, sim simply speaking, our method in researching the history from this part of the world has been relied too much on Western methods, um, take um, the study of anthropology, for example. So, and we tend to use the lens of um, colonizer versus colonized to understand um, colonial history, but kind of overlook um, the organ organic solidarity among the colonized, the common colonized experience that had been there for uh, for decades. So even in our study of anti-colonialism in the past, past few decades, we also rely very much on uh, post-colonial theories uh, and more recently the so-called decolonial uh, theory, um, which um, you know derived from the U.S. academia. But I think we have had the kind of indigenous um, method in study the region. Um, take, um, for example. Um, uh, um, Han Su Yin, uh, the well-known writer who, who came to Malaya in, and taught at Nanyang University in 1950s and 60s, she actually offered a course in Nanyang University titled Contemporary Asian Literature uh, in the Context of National Emergence from Colonialism, very long title, and, and she featured um, Asian authors' works um, uh, written in or translated into English um, for example, Tagore, um, uh, Amin Ali, you know, Achibe, etc. So um, this was actually two decades before the term post-colonial was even coined in, in the U.S. academia. So I think we did have our own methods in creating um, uh, the kind of decolonial knowledge. For example, in the works of, of Osman Awang or, or Tam Malaka or other leftist thinkers, uh, etc. Uh, which has been dealt with in this book. So uh, my, my title is you know, Towards Malaya as Method. It actually means an, an approach uh, or an aspiration that, and, and that doesn't suggest that we already have a method to, 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 to study, study. I think the important thing for us is to kind of look across our neighbors, inter-referencing across Asia and Southeast Asia, and uh, not merely look into the West to find our intellectual or even uh, theoretical resources. So I think maybe right, it's worth mentioning that Malaya as method, it's not only a, 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 an intel intellectual slogan, but also of, of practice. Is By practice, I mean, um, how do people kind of translate their ideas into action and as seen in the anti-colonial movements decades ago, and um, how should we continue doing it in, in our cur current situation? So that being said, I, I think, um, the practice and the discussion of decolonialism, uh, de decoloniality should not be confined to the academia, but also um, kind of extend to, to the society. So I, um, so that's a general response. If you like um, to, to know more about our approach and um, the works of other contributors, please go to the Garabudaya's website to, to get a book. And um, because of the time, I. Uh, I'm sorry, we can't um, cover all the questions in the Q and A uh, chat box, and but I've, I'm sure the the discussion and the, con the the conversation should continue, and this is just um, the beginning. So again, um, uh, I would like to thank you. Uh, thanks for all, all the panelists who join us today. Um, thanks, uh, Romel, Gitian, Abi, PJ, and. Tony for joining us. So we'd like to thank our staff, Naomi, who set up this webinar and help us with the uh, technical and logistic issues. And thank you all for bring, being with us today. Um, uh, we hope to uh, see you around uh, and have a good uh, holiday. Thank you.